Okay, I guess we're ready to start the workshop. Valley EV Aviation Ground Innovations Coalition presented by Joseph Oldham, Director of CalStart San Joaquin Valley Clean Transportation Center and Keith Berthold, Executive Director of Fresno Metro Ministry. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, it's, uh, hopefully this is on. I may not need it. It's my pleasure to be here with you this evening. Uh, my name is Joseph Oldham. I'm the uh, director for the CalStart San Joaquin Valley Clean Transportation Center. Our office is in Fresno. We also have an office in uh, Stockton. And we work very closely with uh, Mrs. Linda Urata with uh, the Kern Cog and Project Clean Air. And so we're really excited about the opportunity to present to you this evening about what we consider the next revolution and the, the next great opportunity for the San Joaquin Valley in transportation and innovative mobility. So what you see before you on the screen, this photograph was taken at Fresno Chandler Executive Airport a few months ago. The four aircraft that you see there represent the largest concentration of production electric aircraft in the United States right now. We have these four aircraft that were uh, purchased through a special grant from Fresno County as a demonstration project for advanced electric aircraft as a valid technology and uh, developing opportunity. And uh, this project has just been an amazing project to work on. It's probably the highlight of my career. And I've been in this, in this business of uh, developing alternative fuels and advanced transportation technology for quite a few decades. So we, I think we all kind of know what our current San Joaquin Valley transportation choices are. We have personal automobiles, transit buses, motor coaches, Amtrak. Uh, we do have some commercial airline opportunities, but those are limited, primarily just to Fresno, Bakersfield. Uh, some opportunities in, in Merced and very limited opportunities in Stockton. Commercial charter aircraft are available, and of course we have private aircraft. But the future is actually going to be very different, and at this point I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Urata, and she's going to pre present a video that we have uh, that Boeing has developed to show their vision of what our future for transportation is going to look like. Imagine a world at your fingertips, changing how we move and connect, bringing the world around you closer to home. Boeing is building that future now. We're at a convergence point. The global population is growing. The explosion of e-commerce drives expectations of frequent, fast delivery. Commutes are getting longer. We're running out of space to build. These challenges call for innovation to reimagine travel and transport. We have the technologies and enablers to support autonomous on-demand mobility. Boeing experts are prototyping vehicles to explore and validate these technologies. We're investing in ecosystem development with partners of all sizes from all industries. Advances in connectivity, analytics, AI, machine learning, and propulsion will help us shape the future of seamless on-demand mobility when, where, and at the scale needed. This new world of travel and transport is more than the next generation of vehicles. The surrounding ecosystem will enable this radical change in mobility, connecting goods and people around the world, preserving safety, creating much needed convenience and efficiency. It won't all happen at once. Integration of new vehicles and systems will evolve from small autonomous air vehicles to larger purpose-built aircraft. This evolution will reshape mobility to meet the needs of a growing on-demand economy, all made possible by a safe and reliable next-generation air traffic management system, allowing piloted and autonomous air vehicles to coexist safely. Innovative propulsion systems to improve economics, reduce emissions, and access both densely and sparsely populated areas safely. Digital infrastructure supported by machine learning and data analytics to optimize operations design and execution. A software and technology suite that helps create safe, seamless mobility while protecting the security of people and information. Integration with existing transportation networks, unlocking the potential of underutilized infrastructure. Boeing has a legacy of building the future. 
driven by a passion for taking humanity further. We have a track record of tackling challenges with the safest, most reliable solutions, changing how goods are moved and people connect around the world. We've created a network of satellites and revolutionized global communication systems. We've created vast, secure information networks with millions of users, nodes, and advanced data analytics. For decades, we've tested the boundaries of autonomous technologies from seabed to space. Boeing has made the unimaginable a reality for more than 100 years, and we haven't done it alone. We'll continue to work with other industry leaders and new and existing partners to create a vision, an ecosystem for the next generation of mobility systems to be imagined, designed, developed, and delivered. We're identifying new business models to fundamentally change the way we approach the market. We're supporting and investing in new technologies and incubating new businesses we know are critical to support this future vision. A future that's better for society and the environment. Join us on our journey. So that video was produced by Boeing a little over a year ago. Uh, about the time that we actually acquired our aircraft. And they actually reached out to us and came and have had several visits uh, with us, sent their chief test pilots down to uh, evaluate the aircraft that we are operating. Uh, we've developed a, actually a very strong relationship with them. And what we've learned in the year that we've had these aircraft and operating them there in the, here in Fresno County is that there's a huge opportunity. When we started working on this project with the FAA, they told us that there was over 57 companies that were working on designs of both vertical takeoff and fixed wing electric propulsion vehicles. And now that number has grown to 157. Right now, our plans are to leverage our sustainable aviation project to really bring outside investment into the valley. And we're starting to already see the interest in the valley as a region for testing and validation of these aircraft. When we got our aircraft in uh, a year ago, the FAA actually had no problems issuing an airworthiness certification for our aircraft, even though they were very reluctant to uh, issue certifications for two aircraft that were also bought in the LA basin and have still had difficulties uh, flying in that region. So for once, the San Joaquin Valley has a, has a advantage, a competitive advantage, over the Bay Area and Los Angeles in an area of technology. And we believe that we should really take advantage of that. So our whole goal of this coalition that we're working to build is to expand the network of electric aircraft charging to facilitate the future deployment of these aircraft in our eight-county region. Through our grant that we had from Fresno County, we've set up three airports in Fresno County with charging infrastructure to support our aircraft operation. Mendota to the west, Fresno Chandler in the middle, and City of Reedley to the, to the east. Our goal with this coalition is to set up that infrastructure from Kern County all the way to Sacramento and include even areas in, uh, near the Bay Area where these aircraft could safely operate. And our, and our further goal is to test and validate thin haul electric commuter airliners and eVTOL operations. So the technology that you've seen in that video was not only uh, fixed wing aircraft, but also electric vertical and takeoff and landing aircraft. And these vehicles are being designed for urban air transport uh, and the goal there is to reduce, is to reduce the, tra uh, the commute times of people that live in Los Angeles or the Bay Area. But those aircraft are going to be needed to be tested. And we've already shown that there's a huge value in using those aircraft in connecting our rural communities that are right now are, are quite isolated and it requires quite a lot of time to get to those locations. And further, we really want to create new training and job opportunities and to improve the zero emission uh, rural community uh, connectivity. So some of the project benefits are, I'm gonna click through this slide fairly quickly, I'm not gonna read all of these. So the aircraft at the upper, in the upper photo is actually the uh, X-57 that's being tested right now at uh, the Armstrong Test Center at Edwards Air Force Base. That's a design that uses multiple electric 
uh, propulsion uh, units along the wing and can almost take off vertically because once the, you turn on those motors, they create enough lift across that wing that the aircraft can almost lift off vertically. That aircraft uh, design that you see at the bottom is what's referred to as the thin hull commuter airliners. Because electric propulsion costs such a fraction of what it costs to uh, use uh, internal combustion engines, the uh, pa uh, passenger loads to be economically viable can actually be quite small. They can be five to 10 people and they can act, these airlines will actually make money because these aircraft cost so little to operate. Just to give you a sense of the cost differential in operation, the uh, aircraft that we are currently operating and that I'm flying in, in Fresno County, they cost us about $4 an hour to fly compared to about $40 an hour to fly a conventional piston engine aircraft. So the change, the cost of operational is significantly, significantly less. And for the future, we see the opportunity to use solar, which obviously the Valley has a huge uh, advantage of. We have a lot of solar already here. There's a lot of technology being developed for charging of electric ground vehicles. These particular units that you see are manufactured by a company called Envision Solar in San Diego. They're designed specifically to charge cars and buses, but the same power requirement for charging a car or bus could be used to charge the aircraft that I'm currently flying or in many of the designs that are being worked on today. And the aircraft manufacturers themselves are coming up with charger designs uh, that are look an awful lot like the car chargers that we're seeing to developed and deployed now uh, up and down the valley and across the state. This is a design that Pipistrel, the company that manufactures the aircraft that we have, has come up with. And they've uh, actually got a few of these units that they've started to uh, seek to deploy down in the LA basin. And then these are just a few examples of some of the new aircraft that are currently on the horizon. Some of these are going to be uh, in production probably within the next <coughs> two years. The one on the left is a two-seat trainer that will have about a three-hour range. The one on the upper right is an actual electric vertical and takeoff and landing aircraft. That, that aircraft is uh, manufactured by a company that is currently owned by Larry Page, who is the co-founder of Google. And uh, actually, that prototype is flying in Hollister, which is just right across the hills from Fresno. And then uh, Zunam Aero, that uh, airliner that you see down below, that's a hybrid electric design. Uh, that company is heavily supported by both Boeing and JetBlue. And their plans are to have their prototype flying later this year. The uh, Cora is currently flying, and so is the Sunflyer. This is how NASA perceives the evolution of electrified uh, aviation over the next few decades. As you can see, we're probably down there around that 2020 mark. We have uh, the first demonstration aircraft and a f early production aircraft like the ones we have. And uh, within the next five to 10 years, we're going to see larger and larger platforms as this technology evolves. And the same thing that's driving this technology is driving the automotive industry, and it's these things. It's advances in battery technology that supporting handheld mobile devices is what's really driving both the aviation industry as well as the automotive industry in terms of the battery uh, energy storage. Currently, these are the flight operations that we're doing with the aircraft that we have in Fresno County. Uh, we take them uh, to multiple different airports. They have at least 50 nautical miles of range on a charge and still have about 27% state of charge. It's a good reserve when you land. Uh, their cruising speed is anywhere from 100 miles an hour to about 70 miles an hour, just depending on how much energy you want to use. Flying them is very similar to driving an electric car. If you mash on the throttle on an electric car, you get less range. If you are conservative on the throttle in an electric car, you get more range. The aircraft operate th very much the same. They also regenerate in descent, so the prop turns into a wind generator and puts power back into the battery as you descend. And they're equipped with ballistic recovery parachutes in case there is a problem, a major problem, that you can pop the chute and the whole airplane comes down, uh, which is kind of nice, but I would probably not use it. <laughs> I'd just as soon land the airplane because they fly really nicely. 
Um, we did some analysis looking uh, using data from our conversations with many of the manufacturers that are working on these advanced designs. And for the thin hull commuter airliners, the range of those aircraft will facilitate development of new routes that currently would open up opportunities for commercial air travel from communities like Porterville, uh, Visalia, uh, Merced, uh, all, all up and down the valley uh, for routes that would go relatively short distances but could be commercially viable to the coast and to the Bay Area. And these would be to uh, airports that currently are underutilized airports that are not the major hubs, not San Francisco International or LAX. You'd fly into smaller airports nearer to the locations that you'd actually want to be at, like, some, like uh, Reed Hillview in San Jose or down in um, uh, El Monte down in the uh, LA Basin. And then when we start looking at eVTOL operations where no runway is actually necessary, it opens up incredible opportunities. Uh, this was just a quick snapshot of looking at the ranges that the eVTOLs are planned to be able to achieve and connecting communities like Huron <coughs> and uh, other places that don't have airports currently but are a long distance from major services like in Fresno. And then our objectives for this uh, coalition is really to establish a working group uh, in California. There's one already existing in, in Washington State, uh, which is kind of obvious that there would be because Boeing is a major employer there and Boeing is heavily invested in this technology. Uh, but we need one here because we've got about 15 companies right now in California that are designing and building these aircraft and are moving in this direction. Promote the development of the infrastructure to support them. Uh, engage the governor's office. The uh, California obviously has a major move to electrify transportation. Unfortunately, aviation is not one of the focuses of the California Air Resources Board right now, and it really should be in our opinion. Uh, and get the support for demonstration projects that increase mobility while at the same time reducing our environmental impact. And with that, I'm going to ask Mr. Berkthold to come up and kind of talk about our regional organizational framework. Thank you. Thanks for letting us come and talk to you today. Um, Joseph and I have known each other for 15 years. We worked together at the city of Fresno on the general plan update uh, during the aughts when uh, we had some struggles uh, trying to raise money to actually be in government and have resources. And we learned about a lot of things uh, that we thought would really be beneficial to our communities in the valley. What Joseph's really told you in, in a few words is that we have a competitive advantage in the San Joaquin Valley for testing and validating these new propulsion, propulsion, propulsion systems for electric aircraft, and we can integrate that with ground transportation, electrification as well. These are all things that are obviously environmentally friendly, but they could also be a huge force for economic development throughout the valley. We have over 20 general aviation airports that are underutilized. These could all be innovation hubs for testing and validating electric aircraft, connecting back to our cities. Most of them are in or near opportunity zones, so there could be an investment thesis there. Uh, we think that uh, this is the time to take advantage. If I had to say what, what's the time frame here, and I used a baseball metaphor, this whole move uh, on electric aviation and integrating it with electric tra uh, ground transportation, we, we're not even in the first inning yet. We're still doing batting practice. And we have a chance to put stuff into place in the San Joaquin Valley and connect it in ways we could create thousands and thousands of jobs and draw in new industry with new job certifications, a number of things, by connecting these dots. But we need to work together as a region. We will not get the attention of the governor's office unless really all eight counties are talking with each other. That's the reason we're coming to the, all of the Valley Cogs to say, let's get electric aviation and electric ground transportation connected together and see if we can't get a working group established in the San Joaquin Valley. Look at the opportunity zone laws. You guys are all familiar with opportunity zones. Those need to be changed in ways that will generate more investment in our rural areas and in our, our, our stranded airports and things like that. Uh, we, we need 5G infrastructure in these facilities, not just in the, the highest concentrated density urban areas, but in these kinds of uh, rural airports so that we can bring our kids out and do career technical education and things like that at these facilities and get them innovating. I guess the whole strategy here is to create new partnerships across the counties. Uh, do One of the things we're calling that for that we'd really like to get your support to do is a worldwide study 
of what uh, electric propulsion manufacturers need in terms of jobs and facilities and see if we can't draw some of them into the valley to create new manufacturing facilities. On and on and on. So that's kind of the thrust of this is to create these opportunities. We felt like it should start with our valley cogs. You're in, you're in the transportation business and we feel like your understanding these concepts and getting behind them can drive workforce development, can drive community colleges, and drive a lot of other kinds of partnerships that we need to actually make this a success for the Valley. So that's really why we're here. We have this little flyer. I hope you'll look at it and kind of read through it. I think it's in your packets. Uh, we think we're on the edge of something um, really fairly profound for our Valley that's new, and we either take advantage of it or we don't. I think you know, if we don't, the Chinese will. Uh, I don't know if you saw the story, but it was on probably, uh, maybe it's two months ago on 60 Minutes. The Chinese are incentivizing 100 companies to compete with each other in China to see which five are going to dominate the global production of electric vehicles. I mean, these guys are strategic. If we're not strategic, we're going to lose the race. So this is an opportunity where we have a competitive advantage right now to test and validate this kind of aircraft and connect these dots. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, put it open to any questions. We'll be glad to answer them and uh, hope we can get your support as we build this coalition and continue to move it along. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, now the range says right now, I think 15. Microphone. Please. <coughs> okay. Um, I know uh, on the weights and balance, but the fuel part of it, you want to write the fuel for payload, but Altitudes, will that affect your distance and, and heat on, on, on these uh, are, are as the same as internal combustion engines? But the same. They are uh, pretty much the same. Um, you can't offload fuel to add more payload. Yeah. Um, so my payload is my useful load, about 380 pounds in these particular aircraft. Um, they have a service ceiling of 12,000 feet. Uh, the only reason the ceiling is at 12,000 feet is because by the time you climb to 12,000 feet, okay. you've used up most of the, your energy to get there, and um, the engine doesn't care because it doesn't breathe any air. So there's no loss of power as you go out, uh, go higher. Um, the aircraft will regenerate on descent, and I've had them up to 7,500 feet. Um, it uses I get down to about 50% state of charge uh, with a steady climb up to 7,500. But then when I turn around and begin my descent, I put energy back into the battery and, you know, I don't have any reduction in range. Uh, the range now is still about 75 miles approximately? The range is uh, conservatively about 55 to 60 nautical miles yeah. with, with still about a 25% state of charge and reserve. The technology developing each year, yes. that's, that's improving as oh, far yes. as the battery deal. Yes, yes. Because right now, these, these aircraft have uh, batteries in them that have about 230 watt hours per kilogram. And when you compare that to gasoline, which has about 700 watt hours per kilogram, you can see the difference in the energy storage capacity of the current battery technology versus what we have with petroleum fuel. But that improvement is steadily increasing. We're seeing about a 7 to 10 percent improvement in energy storage uh, per year. So uh, within probably three to five years, uh, these aircraft will be easily able to fly with the same size battery packs, easily be able to fly for close to two hours. And then what the life of the batteries would be in a change out on, on those planes? We're really not sure, and neither the manufacturer isn't either. Uh, we're factoring in, we're saying that we're going to build reserves to replace the batteries after five years of steady flight training operations. That's what the aircraft are designed for, is a flight training uh, operation. Can how many hours on the, per motor, on the uh, electric motor would be if we have to change the amount, or they have a, a requirement? The electric, motor, the electric motor <coughs> has to be inspected every 2,000 hours. Uh, you do that three times, and you replace it at 6,000 hours. So it's extremely robust. Um, most of the piston engine aircraft that are out there today, you have to do a complete engine replacement at every 2,000 hours. Yeah. And these aircraft, you can go for 6,000. Thank you. OK, you're welcome. I have a question. Yes, sir. What is the cost of this aircraft? Uh, these aircraft uh, were about $140,000, um, brand new. And uh, the chargers were about another 10. 
So we have about $150,000 invested in each aircraft. Uh, there was the, the grant covered about, a, was a little over a million dollars. And so most of that funding went to the purchase of the aircraft, but there was also funding in the grant for two new hangars at the city of Mendota. And we put $90,000 in the grant for uh, youth scholarships for flight training assistance. Uh, there's a huge and growing pilot shortage right now. And we have a great opportunity to train up our young people if we can get them in the door. But the problem is the cost of getting in the door. Uh, a typical private pilot certificate today is about a ten to $12,000 upfront investment. And we were hoping, we were working with this project because we can lower the cost of operation for the aircraft to get that aircraft rental rate down lower to uh, lower that barrier. And since you um, expressed that these batteries will eventually need to be replaced, um, has the manufacturers estimated how much the cost of replacing those batteries would be? The, uh, they do have an estimate if we were going to replace them today. Uh, they haven't actually come up with, a rep with an estimate of what it would cost to replace them, say, five years from now. But we all are anticipating, because the cost of batteries continues to drop very radically, that it would be about half of what it would be today. And what is the cost today? Do you know? Today, it would be about $20,000, and we anticipate in about five years, it'll probably be closer to about 10 or 12. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I, I had a question. I just wasn't yes. sure what exactly you want from the different COGS. Well, really at this point what we're looking for is really uh, to inform you of this technology, to inform you of this opportunity, and then s when we get to a point where after we've done all of the engagement with the COGS is really to develop a um, some letters of support that would go along with us as we engage with the governor's office and uh, the California Air Resources Board. And so, and, and plus, what we also found is that as in our conversations with the manufacturers and the companies that are working on this technology, they're looking for places where people are willing and anxious to have their aircraft operating. And as we go around and meet with the COGS and meet with the representatives from the counties, we're able to identify those counties and then bring that information back to these companies. And then their interest is, oh, okay, great. We know that we can bring our aircraft to Bakersfield, or we know we can bring our aircraft to Fresno. You know, and then it opens up great opportunities for them. One of the uh, companies that I mentioned up there, um, Kitty Hawk, that is manufacturing the Cora, They've actually taken that aircraft to New Zealand to do early, f early testing. The reason was because the New Zealand government said, we want your aircraft here. We want the notoriety and we want the fact that we want to have the um, coverage that New Zealand is open to this technology. So they've taken, all of the, they've taken their aircraft to New Zealand to do testing. And you know <laughs> that's a shame because California is where they developed the aircraft, right? right? So, yes, yeah, Keith. So part of this process is approaching the governor's office, and we'd like to work through the Valley Cog directors, and we wanted to make sure we came and presented ourselves personally to you, so that you could authorize and empower your director to be working with the other Cog directors across the valley. We will be bringing proposals back to you, specific proposals to support. But we felt like it's like a vacuum if we haven't come here and introduced ourselves to you and give you an idea about the energy and the potential of this proposal. Does that make sense? Great. So we'll be bringing specific proposals back to you. We wanted to get to know you and you to know us. Okay. Appreciate it. What, help me out. What is EVTOL? EVTOL? VTOL is an acronym for Vertical Takeoff and Landing. EVTOL means it's Electric Vertical Takeoff and Landing. Yeah. So you're, you're not involved in that yet? Well, I am involved in that, um, but I can't talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Bob, thank you. Chris, Any more? Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Can Couch. you leave your contact information with us? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, there's some at the very bottom of this, but I think that's just one individual. Both of our contact information, phone numbers, emails are there. 
It's on the bottom? I don't have my glasses, so I can't. Yeah, it. I think it says Joseph something. Yeah. Thank Hello, you. That's Keith. I th Keith my, mine's there as well as Keith's. And uh, All right. Linda you. knows how to get a hold of me as well. And so. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other Thanks. questions? <clears throat> We're good? Okay. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Are you flying back? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. And every time I get on the 99, it's like, oh, where's my plane? <laughs> Thanks Thank again. You very much. Well, that's good timing. We're 6.30. We're ready to start our current Council of Governments Transportation Planning Policy Committee. Okay, Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call, please. Alvarado. Here. B. Smith. B. Smith. I am here. Cantu. Couch. Here. Crump. Here. Trujillo. Here. Cryer. Here. Lucinovich. Here. Mauer. Here. P. Smith. Reina. Here. Scrivener. Oleo. Here. Is that the deal? Will it be Kiernan. Is that the deal? Will it be uh, Kersey filling in for Kiernan. Miller. Here. Bellow. Here. And Van White. Is there one more? Okay. Thank you. Item three, public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter, not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask for a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes with the authority of the chair to extend the time limit as deemed appropriate for conducting the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Any public comments? Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the board. My name is Troy Hightower. I'm with Kern Transportation Foundation, or KTF. And I just wanted to announce that we had our first um, major conference May 1st on logistics and distribution. It was very well attended. A lot of um, people from your agencies attended. And I just want to express our appreciation for that, as well as Kern Cog did participate and gave presentations to that event, and we plan to make it an annual event. And I encourage everyone to attend in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hightower. Any other public comments? Good evening, sir. Uh, Ray Scott, Price Disposal here in Bakersfield. Also, the president of the board for Keep California Beautiful. February, we wrapped up our K through 12 recycling statewide recycling challenge. As you see, uh, the results I gave you for the last five years, we've gone from 45 schools to 493 schools in five years. Kern County has done very well this year, once again, taking 10, pro 10 awards, with four of them being first place awards and $7,200 going to our schools. Um, Kern County is right up there with LA County, San Diego County, um, and so we've done very well. And of course, City of Arvin for the last five years has been the only school district to consistently place in the K through 12 challenge every year that we've, we've had it. The second item that I, I gave to you is keep California beautiful. I'm here because of people like Mayor Hall. Mayor Hall I endorsed what I was doing with the Green Expo for Kern County, endorsed and supported me going to Keep California Beautiful and then eventually becoming president for Keep California Beautiful. 
So I started a new award for the outstanding male and female that are supporting Keep California Beautiful after Mayor Hall's call to action, be the change. And so this year, of course, was John Enriquez for, from Bakersfield, and the woman of the year was from uh, LA, LA City School District. She only has a thousand schools to, to deal with, but she is a key person that you give her something, she runs with it, she makes it happen. And that's what Mayor Hall always enjoyed was recognizing people's efforts. And the last thing is, I've been given a grant by Keep America Beautiful where I received 40,000 nine volt batteries to give out to cities, counties. So whether it be uh, social services, police department, fire department, I have 20,000 of them left that I can distribute throughout the county. They come in cases of 200. Um, and so they are free to you from Keep America Beautiful the only thing that we ask is that you, you tell the person who you're giving them to how to properly dispose of or recycle them. So my contact information is on this sheet. Please give me a call and I'd love to be able to bring them out to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott, and we appreciate the work and appreciate always hearing about the good work of Harvey Hall. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Next speaker. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, Krincog members. Kevin Barnes, the Solid Waste Director for the City of Bakersfield, just here tonight to uh, thank the Council for the past support it's given in the freeway litter uh, funding. Uh, it's been a very successful program. We look forward to it continuing again this year. Uh, Caltrans is continuing their allotment that we've become accustomed to. Uh, is helping uh, uh, not only clean up the freeways in the greater Bakersfield area, but it's now employing approximately 54 individuals through the Bakersfield Homeless Center. Uh, if you hadn't heard, the successful program that's been running for a few years uh, got a boost uh, in December from Caltrans uh, through the plea of Mayor Go. Uh, Caltrans was willing to put out an additional half million dollars to be used in the first half of 2019. That launched four additional crews. And there's a little distinction. The first crews that we're accustomed to are freeway litter crews, litter only, uh, not touching vegetation because of union issues, job descriptions for Caltrans and so forth. Uh, but the four new crews uh, with the special funding are turned freeway beautification crews, and they're allowed to help Caltrans crew with the vegetation. So you may have uh, seen in the, in the greater area here a little improvement in the, in the weeds and dead brush and so forth. So that's a direct result of the success our communities had in, in the program that we all put together. And uh, Caltrans recognizing that, calling up one day literally uh, five minutes to five on Friday afternoon saying, could Bakersfield use another half million dollars? Uh, they chose that because of the success that, that our communities had. So we're grateful for that, and uh, we hope it continues onward. Uh, thank you. You mentioned that was countywide? No. <coughs> Just that, Bakersfield City? Bakersfield area, yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Barnes. You. Good work. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Any other public speakers? Seeing none, next item is presentation of 2019 Community Survey Report by Brian Godby. Yes. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, board. I'm pleased to be here again as I was looking at our archives. This is the 12th visit to Bakersfield to present survey data, so we're happy to, uh, to be here again. Uh, jumping right in, let's see. The advancing doesn't seem to be working, and I need to point it somewhere. Nope. Okay, thank you, Becky. <coughs> uh, so jumping in, <coughs> as you know, uh, we've been commissioned to conduct a telephone and online survey <coughs> of Kern County residents 
the objectives were to look at overall opinion uh, of uh, current and future quality of life, uh, to look at the issues that they thought would uh, most contribute to future quality of life, uh, to look at daily commute behavior, uh, to look at the impact of uh, new employers on potential traffic issues, uh, to look at housing preferences, and of course in the full report there's a wealth of demographic and behavioral characteristics. Uh, in terms of the methodology, uh, this is uh, a telephone and online survey as it's been for a few years when we started this back in the old da days of 2008. It was just a landline and cell phone, but now we've added uh, online uh, interviewing. Uh, the universe is still the same. It's the adult population, about 620,000, 621,000 in round number residents in the county. We were in the field from February 19th through the beginning of March. The average phone survey is 22 minutes long. Uh, we don't really know how long it takes people to complete the survey online because they could start, go have dinner, watch some TV, and finish at 3 in the morning, depending on their schedule. And it, what we do know is that people hit this final submit button really 24 hours a day. So uh, being online gives us the ability to communicate with them or take surveys from them on their schedule, whatever that might be, not on our schedule. Uh, the total sample uh, we were shooting for was 1,200. We finished 1,351 uh, interviews. That was 61 on uh, cell phones, phone calls, uh, 237 landline, and then most of them were online, uh, and that's 1,053. Uh, the world has very rapidly changed, obviously, as we all know. Uh, 20 of those interviews were conducted in Spanish, which was an option for the respondents. Uh, all of that gives us a margin of error of plus or minus 2.66%, which is comparable uh, to what we have had in the past. Um, and as we're looking at the data, when we're looking at the overall numbers, that means that you have to see about a 5%, a little over 5% difference from one number to another number for it to be statistically significant. So jumping into the key findings, uh, the first set of questions dealt with uh, satisfaction with the quality of life and the future quality of life, and this is the current. Uh, and as you can see here, 67%, if you add the very satisfied and somewhat satisfied together, um, are satisfied overall. Uh, that's actually down a little bit. It's not statistically different from what it was in 2018, where it was 72% in round numbers. Uh, but if you look at the trend over the last four years, it has clearly been going down. That's not actually unusual. Um, we've done a lot of surveys, more for cities than for counties, uh, and, and many of them in the Bay Area, and we've seen the same, same pattern. Uh, I think what's going on is we are a little bit the victim of our own success in California as the economy has improved. Um, people um, are dealing with other frustrations. And we'll see a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, in the next question, uh, this is what they think uh, the, the future quality of life will be, whether it's better or, uh, or not. Uh, and we've done the same thing, or you can do the same thing, add the much better and somewhat better together. You see we're at 30% think it will be better in the future. That's down a little bit, but again, not statistically significant from uh, 2018 where it was 34% and 37% uh, in 2017. Again, you see the same four-year trend, so it seems to be a pattern again uh, as the economy has improved. Now the next couple questions were actually open-ended, and we asked them what you like most about living in your city or town, uh, and we recorded those. Uh, there were some pre-coded responses, and then there was also the opportunity to fill in the blank if they wanted. Uh, the top tier of items, thinking back to the statistical significance, was the cost of living at 40% in round numbers, cost of housing at 40 or 37, uh, and the small town atmosphere at 36. Uh, those are pretty similar to where they were uh, in 2018. Uh, cost of living is up just a little bit as a most like feature, uh, but statistically speaking, it's really not significant. Uh, cost of housing is up as well uh, as a feature they like, uh, as, uh, and then small town atmosphere is virtually the same. In what we call what a second tier, meaning it's statistically different from the first tier, is location. 
Uh, and then in the third tier, it, again, statistically different from the second tier would be sense of community, natural resources, weather and climate, safe neighborhoods and communities, uh, farming and agriculture. And they're on down from there and quickly we're approaching uh, single digits. In terms of the things that they liked least, and this is sometimes where we wind up focusing, uh, it was interesting the presentation we heard before because as has been in the past, air quality is the item that people like the least about their city and town. Uh, we're at basically 50% in round numbers. Um, that's not statistically different than it was in 2018 when it was 47%, but it's going up. Uh, Crime rate uh, is at 47%. That was 38% last year, so that's going up as well. Homelessness, we didn't actually have on the list last year, uh, but it's at 45% this year, so uh, adding that to the pre-coded list has certainly had an impact, um, uh, and people are, are citing that. In what, again, we would call our second tier of importance, we have gang violence uh, at 36. That's up from 30%, so that's a significant increase. In our third tier, we have job opportunities, traffic congestion, and lack of community resources. Um, and all of those are up from the previous year as well. So the top seven items in terms of things they like least are not new, basically, but they are up. Uh, so that probably contributes to that overall quality of life that we saw at the outset. Now the next uh, several slides um, are the details. I'm going to give you the high level. Uh, this question was, what do you think uh, are the most important issues uh, way as you look forward 20 years uh, to improving the quality of life? And without looking at the chart right now, those top seven were improving crime prevention and gang prevention programs. Again, that's sort of similar to what we just saw with uh, the things people like least, preserving water supply, improving the quality of public education, maintaining local streets and roads, improving water quality, creating more high paying jobs, and improving air quality. So those are the top things that people would like to see uh, focused on to uh, improve the quality of life in the next 20 years. Uh, these next slides that we'll look at drill down on each of those items and compare them with where we were uh, in the previous um, surveys. Uh, we've actually not showing all of them because the slide would be impossible to read, um, but uh, we've uh, selected some back to 2014. So uh, in terms of creating more high paying jobs, uh, that's at 3.44, that's virtually the same as the low point, which was 3.41. So uh, it's not the lowest, uh, but statistically they're all pretty much tied. Encouraging new businesses to relocate into the county uh, is, uh, is at 3.23. Uh, again, that's not the lowest, it's not the highest, uh, and there's not much change there either. Moving on to community assets and infrastructure, similar pattern, uh, revitalizing older neighborhoods and business districts is 3.16. Uh, it's not the, uh, the lowest and it's not the highest, but statistically speaking, they're all about the same. And the same is true for uh, creating more affordable housing. When we look at transportation choices and those variables, there's a little bit more uh, variation from one to the other. Uh, expanding highways is less important than it was uh, in the past, uh, and that's a significant difference, and perhaps that's because you've uh, completed a, a variety of new highways. Uh, reducing traffic congestion uh, is um, at about 2.74. That's not the lowest, but it's not the highest either. It sort of is inching up, you could say, but again, not statistically significant. Maintaining local roads and streets is also inching up, uh, and expanding local bus service is about the same in terms of its importance as last year. Uh, now again, that's importance towards improving the quality of life 20 years out. Uh, in terms of transportation choices, uh, improving public transit um, to other cities is about the same as it was last year. Uh, and maintaining and improving sidewalks and bike lanes uh, is actually at the lowest level it's been uh, going back to 2014. Um, so it's less important to the future. That doesn't mean it's not important now. Uh, providing public transit and carpooling uh, is about the same as last year. The next diet grouping is conserving uh, undeveloped land and natural resources. 
uh, improving air quality is about the same as it was last year, but it's pretty high. As I noted uh, earlier, it's on that top seven list of things to think about. Preserving water quality is about the same as last year, but again, it's pretty high uh, overall. Improving water quality uh, is at the second highest level that it's um, ever been at, and so it's inching up. Uh, again, statistically from year to year, it's not a big deal, but it is at the you know top of the list. It's in one of those items in the top seven. And preserving open spaces at 2.9 uh, is a little bit higher than it was uh, in uh, 2018, but just really not statistically significant as well. And then next is uh, the use of efficient development. Uh, developing a variety of housing options is um, a little bit higher uh, than it was last year. Uh, so people are thinking about housing for the future. Uh, and then finally, um, rounding this out is services and safety. Uh, fire and emergency medical services is a little lower than last year, a little less important for the future. Improving local health care and social services is tied with last year, so no change there. Uh, improving crime prevention and gang prevention programs uh, is um, at the same level that it's been at. It's pretty important. Um, and again, that's one of the things we saw on that the top li of seven list. And then finally, improving the quality of public education at uh, 3.53 um, is the lowest um, for the future, but 3.5 is pretty high, particularly when you sort of put that in context of that scale, which 4.0 would be the highest you could get. So all of these are pretty important items. So at this point in the survey, we changed gears and asked people their mode choice. Uh, and uh, we did this a little bit different this year in that we added autonomous self-driving cars. And so what happened is drive alone went down. Uh, be, and the number of people who selected s autonomous self-driving cars went up. Now, we could probably do a focus group on just that. Um, not everybody has a Tesla, <laughs> obviously, so it's not really self-driving or autonomous cars, but we, th we suspect that enough people have newer cars which have some autonomous features, you know, lane notifications, cruise control, those sorts of things that are all automated, uh, that they might be thinking that that's what they're driving, even though they're ultimately driving alone. Uh, so if you add that to what we uh, have for drive alone, again, we're back to the 80% that we've seen in the past. Um, and I think that's some of the confusion. I guess the, the final point in that confusion is self-driving car could also be interpreta interpreted as I'm driving myself in my car, <laughs> which is sort of tortured, I realize. But, uh, but there's clearly some confusion that this question brought up or adding this item, this response category to this question, and it makes it seems to make sense to add that uh, to the drive alone. The others are consistent, uh, up a little bit, down a little bit from previous years, but not statistically so. Um, it's just that difference on that first one. Uh, and on, on the next slide, we have the remainder of the items, Uber, uh, Lyft, bike, electric vehicle, um, taxi, et cetera, and those are, again, similar to the previous years. Uh, the next question was our secondary type of uh, transportation for traveling to and from work. Uh, drive alone is higher. Uh, now that could be because all those people who in the first version of this said autonomous self-driving vehicle said, oh yeah, well, I'm a drive alone uh, and, and sort of thought that through a little bit. And so there's a jump there. I think uh, the variation, uh, because when you look at uh, the other items, carpools are down a little bit. Um, it is statistically significant, but just so. Um, walking is down a little bit, but not significant. Uh, Uber and Lyft is up a little bit, but not significant. So all the rest of these, there's some numeric differences, but there really aren't the statistical differences. I think the statistical differences are all wrapped up in this having the new item autonomous and self-driving cars. And the next slide uh, for the same question shows the remainder of the list. Uh, and again, you see the same pattern. Uh, our next question was uh, asking people to rate the traffic flow in their city or town. 
And uh, again, adding the excellent and good together, you see we're actually doing a little better. We're up to 43% in round numbers. That was 41% in 2018. It's not statistically significant, but it's certainly going the right direction or the direction we'd want it to go. Uh, and that's important because it has been higher in the past. In the 2017 to 15 range, we were as high as 56%. Uh, had an excellent or good, then we took a dip in 2018 and now we're heading back up. Uh, we asked a new question this year uh, in terms of what are the reasons for your rating of traffic flow and again looking at sort of different tiers statistically speaking traffic congestion is number one. This is an open-ended response so that's sort of what they told us. Uh, in our second tier we have construction and unsafe drivers uh, in a, in a clearly lower level of uh, response and then in the third tier we have all the rest of the items need wider new roads uh, poor planning growth and uh, development and da on down the list as we get into single digits as we have in the past we've also asked people what their average commute time is and most of this is the same except for the same first grouping. The 10 minutes or less is at 32% in round numbers. It was 21% last year and the year before. So there's a jump there, um, and that could just be an anomaly in the sampling, but it does seem like it might be relevant. Uh, as we move into the uh, higher lengths of commute times, you see those are largely the same. Again, numeric differences, but not statistical differences. Uh, when we look at the average commute miles, uh, five or less is about the same, six to ten is about the same, eleven to twenty uh, is a little bit lower, uh, and so that could contribute to that shorter time, that, or more in the shorter time that we saw before as people are driving sh shorter distances, uh, although on the next slide for the same question, we see that the 21 to 40 miles is actually jumped up. So there's some, uh, some moving around here in both in terms of the commute time and the commute miles uh, that don't, don't necessarily overlap um, and could be just different people. Uh, the next question asks people what their most likely uh, alternative would be if it was available in their area. Uh, and drive alone was again new, it was not offered before, so that sucked up a whole bunch of the responses at 47%. Uh, carpool and vanpool was down a little bit uh, from where we were in 2018 and before, and that is a significant difference. Uh, the autonomous self-driving car obviously wasn't asked before. Uh, express bus service down, but not si significantly so. Uh, same uh, bicycle down, uh, but not statistically significant uh, at that level, um, and uh, on down the list. Uh, next slide shows the remaining items, which are all, again, much lower but consistent from previous years. Uh, one of the new questions that we asked this year was uh, opinion on new employers uh, and their effect on traffic. And because that's a little bit new and novel, uh, we said specifically recently new employers such as Amazon.com have located in Kern County creating many new jobs in the county. These jobs have also created new commuter and truck trips. Do you think these jobs are worth the additional traffic? And as you can see here when you add the probably and definitely worth it together you get 82 percent in round numbers that say it's worth it versus only 13 percent rounded that say it's not worth it so that's a pretty strong indication that people like the jobs and are willing to uh, uh, to deal with the impacts that it might create and the last section of the survey dealt with uh, the housing choices uh, as we've done in the past, we asked people what kind of housing they currently have. Uh, and uh, you can see here that uh, single family home with a small yard is about 37%. It's pretty much the same as where it was last year. Uh, single family home with a large yard um, is down a little bit, but it wouldn't be statistically significant. Uh, town home, condominium, uh, same as before. Again, statistically, uh, building with offices, mixed use, uh, virtually the same. Uh, An apartment is up a little bit, but again, not statistically so. 
The next slide shows them or gives them uh, the question, what would you prefer if you could buy a new house or move currently? And single family home with a small yard, 71% uh, said that they would definitely or probably uh, go that way uh, versus, and each of these was asked independently, so we get, it doesn't add up to 100%. Single family home with a large yard was 84%. So still, uh, people want that single family home with a large yard, and that is up significantly from 2018. Uh, and I think that's probably a function of the economy, too. Times are better. Uh, people are, you know, looking for uh, the best uh, property they can get. Uh, on the next slide, we see the other categories, townhome, uh, mixed use, and apartment. And those are uh, largely the same. Uh, the apartment is up, but just barely uh, statistically significant. So the last few slides are the executive summary, and I won't belabor the point because I've just said all that. <laughs> but if you want to read about it again, <laughs> that's a place where you can read about it. <laughs> so I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, just the, you start off with satisfied, and not satisfied, and 67%. And I know you test a lot of other places and, yeah. and how do we compare and are the trends the same most places? Uh, the trend in uh, virtually everywhere in California is the same. It's going down. Um, and I, I, it's not fun to say that, but that's the reality. Um, and I think it's going down again because there are impacts of the economy being good. There's traffic and crime and housing issues. Um, now, those are not all, all necessarily your issue, um, but those are the common things that we s have seen elsewhere. And we saw in that open-ended question some of those. Um, you started a little bit lower than some other cities uh, or some cities that we do this routinely for. Uh, some of those have been Bay Area cities, and they started higher, uh, but they're creeping down at, in some cases, an alarming rate, particularly those that are at ground zero, and ground zero for the economy is Apple Computer and, and Facebook. So Menlo Park and Cupertino are seeing precipitous declines in quality of life. In their case, it is attributable to traffic and um, to housing issues. So, you know, it's not good, but, you know, you're in company with most of the rest of California. Was this sampling taken all over the county or mostly on the west side of the county? Uh, well, we do a disproportionate sample to make sure that we sample not just Bakersfield, but that we get the mountains and the valley portions. So it's actually 600, there's four areas, um, 600, 200, 200, and 200, and then we weight the data back um, to the, um, the appropriate proportion and I'm looking to see what those are uh, as we're talking here. Um, I'm not sure I've got it in this particular, oh yeah, here it is. So uh, West Kern would have gotten 200 interviews, or I think it's about 180 that it got, uh, but we weight that to 4%. The central, what we call the Central Valley, which obviously has Bakersfield in it, is 80%. The mountain area is 7%, uh, and the East Kern area is 4%. So that's the pr actual proportion, but because West Kern, the mountains, and East Kern are so small, we've always made sure we get 180 to 200 interviews in those areas so we can reflect their opinion, but we don't want to leave it without weighting it because then they would have more impact in these numbers, and we want to make sure that that's proportional. So that's why we do the weighting. On the air quality question, that's still number one. Mm -hmm. Has that changed over the years? I know our, our air quality has greatly improved, but people's perception yep. really hasn't changed. Yeah, it's, um, it's at the bottom of the list of the top seven items as people are looking forward. Uh, it has, uh, when we think about the question that's the open-ended one, uh, it has always been in the top three, um, and it still is. So um, it's it sort of stuck there. Uh, and maybe while the, technically the air quality is improved, the perception is not caught up with that. And that could be, you know, uh, an aesthetic thing as well as, you know, an actual, you know, objective measurement of what air quality actually is. Great. Are these 
Is this presentation going to be online or? Is Chairman, uh, can I ask a question? Bob. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Couch. You, you had a, the things you don't like about your community and homelessness was number three, I think. And I think you said that was the first time that was a choice, even yeah. or even a discussion. First time ever. It had never been even re asked before. Yeah, uh, I looked at 2018 and 2017 and didn't, uh, it wasn't on the list then. Um, so it has popped up. Um, we have, we, it's an open end with a pre coded list, which is the reality of having to do online survey. You have to give people some, some reference points. When we do the phone survey, we pre code it, which means that only our interviewers see it. Um, so it was pre-coded this time, and I think that made the difference. Okay. Um, uh, but that's not to say, again, that it's not an important issue, because when people are thinking about it, now all of a sudden it becomes right. something that they're Thank concerned you. about. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Fox. Up to the microphone, please. Yes, sir. That big yard. Too big a yard. Anyway, I am Dennis Fox. And I mentioned, I've mentioned this before, yesterday. And I was wondering about the cultural factors that are in influencing, particularly on here compared to areas a little to the north regarding water quality and water availability. And since elsewhere in this week, there's a book out, Mark Arax's latest hit piece on this area and the water quality, he says, will be out pretty soon. But we do have enough time to blame other people up north, <laughs> which is, has to do where they focus. The focus up north is more on um, soil, on soil farmers. And down here, in addition, we have a focus on the subsidies uh, in violation of Prop 218. And the subsidy seems gets to where it has a life of its own and is more considered more important than getting the water itself. And he's going to come out with all that stuff. But um, I was wondering how much of that is because of lack of information on that and how much you see a change. Up north, everybody seems to know what's going on here more than we do here. Very interesting. As for the transportation aspects, how many places do you drive on a parkway so you can go home and park in your driveway? I haven't figured that one out, thanks. You have, a, you have answers on that? Uh, yeah, I'm not, sure those are, yeah. I'm not sure those are questions. Yeah, I'm not sure. North Valley? Uh, no, actually, the short answer is no, I don't. Uh, we don't have the comparable data. Um, I do th notice one thing. I mean, I think the water issues are important to this county, um, and that's what the survey has shown for a long time. As I drive down here from the Bay Area, all of a sudden I notice the signs that say, you know, water quality, food, uh, that sort of thing. You know, you don't see that in Alameda County. <laughs> um, so I think that uh, is an issue that is actually salient in this particular county, um, and people are debating it um, all the time. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure where I start seeing those signs, uh, but given the question, I'll, I'll look. <laughs> they, have, they don't have zones of benefit up there, right? Uh, yeah, I couldn't tell you. That's sort of, yeah, I couldn't tell you what the water Thank you. rates are. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Okay, we will now move to item four, consent agenda. Opportunity for public comment. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kerncog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the committee or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, 
the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the committee concerning the item before action is taken. Does any member of the committee wish to remove a consent item? Chairman, I do. I would like to remove item 4C. Any member of the public like to remove any consent items? Okay, can I get a motion on the remainder of the items? So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Trujillo? Yes. Crump? Yes. Alvarado? Yes. Vallejo? Aye. Reyna? Yes. Maurer? Yes. Pryor? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Couch? Yes. Lucinovich? Yes. Kersey? Yes. Bellow? Yes. Miller? Yes. Thank you. Item 4C, Intelligent Transportation Systems, Current Update Monitoring Program, Ms. Pacheco. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, if I could, um, do you just have a question or do you want I, me to I, make I, a presentation? No, I do. I do have a question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I read this report and uh, as I went through the different uh, projects, uh, I realized something that Wasco is notable for its absence. And so uh, I have my question is why this was uh, adopted in uh, last year, I believe June of last year. And uh, why is Wasco not participating? And my second question is can Wasco participate in this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may answer. Yes, um, please. So uh, the same question came up um, during our Transportation Technical Advisory Committee of why there weren't any WASCO projects. Um, there was a, a process in place, you know, um, there was a lot of deliverables in place. Um, this was the 12th deliverable of the project. And um, throughout the process, we did invite WASCO. Um, they actually did attend some workshops. Um, it just so happened that we didn't get any responses back in terms of written documentation. Um, so that's why they weren't in included in any of the project lists. Um, but the document itself is much larger, um, and we do recognize Wasco um, as a stakeholder in the process. Uh, as part of this staff report um, is the annual update. So at this time, um, we can, you know, we reach out to the staff, um, and we have, and they're looking into if they want to have an update to this plan. Um, so at that time, we, we would come back to our Transportation Technical Advisory Committee and ask them if, you know, we include these new projects um, and what is the process for that since we haven't come across that just yet. Um, but there is a process in place in our um, ITS plan. It's called the architecture process. Um, and, and so we would conduct that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's information only, so we don't need a vote. Chairman, do I move to approve at this time? I don't think we need a vote. Okay. It's information only. Thank you. Next item is item five, Kern River Bike Path Extension Project Update. Mr. Pete Smith. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Yolanda Alcatar from the Kern County Public Works Department. She's the lead engineer on this project and will give us a a detailed update of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chairman and members of the board. Um, I had the advanced planning section of the Kern County Public Works um, Engineering Division, and my division is tasked with completion of grant applications, environmental review, right-of-way, and utility responsibilities for all Kern County Public Works projects, including the Kern River Parkway bike trail, which is before you today. Um, there should be a map in your packets of the alignment that we're proposing to move forward with and this project includes construction a 10 foot wide class 1 bike path to match the existing bike path that currently ends near Enos Lane in the city to connect to the Buena Vista aquatic area approximately, approximately 4.5 miles to the north or to the south excuse me. Um, this project will complete the next phase of the Kern River Parkway Trail, which currently spans 21 miles to the east along the Kern River uh, through the city of Bakersfield and loops around to Lake Ming. 
Um, this project was funded as the local MPO project in 2015 with active transportation program funds. The project was unsuccessful in cycle one and then it was revamped and resubmitted in cycle two um, where it scored 87 points out of 100 uh, in that cycle. And the project was awarded 500,000 uh, for the environmental phase, which was authorized in September of 2017. Uh, the construction phase was funded uh, for fiscal year 1819, just over $3 million. However, a one year extension was recently granted due to environmental and right of way delays. Um, Kern County made a 950,000 commitment in local match funds for the design uh, and right of way phases of this project. Uh, there have been a number of difficulties we've had to overcome for this project. Um, since initiation of the project, the county has evaluated 14 alternative routes. Problems ranged from potentially exposing the public to hazardous operations and materials, bridge modernization requirements, Caltran Caltrans oversight, um, and right-of-way roadblocks. Uh, the most significant difficulty has been the environmental clearance uh, phase. And then although the Kern Water Bank has been 100% supportive of this project, they have very sensitive operations on site due to their 17,000 acres of water baking operations that have a dual use as a species conservation area. Kern Water Bank was the first agency in California to develop a habitat conservation plan which protects 34 special status species on site. Although this project is an eligible compatible use, an amendment to the HCP was required to add the county as a beneficiary, which required concurrence by both the state and federal species uh, wildlife services. The final approved alignment to minimize species impacts was to keep our project on the eastern edge of Kern Water Bank property along the I-5. To date, the county has spent over $320,000 in biological studies and reports. For sp um, mostly due to specific uh, species protocol surveys that are time sensitive. <clears throat> However, additional surveys are required prior to construction, including a daily biological monitor during construction, which will add another $180,000 to the project for a total of almost $500,000 in environmental requirements, almost exactly what we were funded in 1718. Um, we even had a four month delay due to the federal shutdown because US Fish and Wildlife Service couldn't review our project. But I'm happy to announce that Caltrans has finally approved our environmental clearance for this project. Uh, currently, um, the last property we need to acquire is the Kern County Raceway track. Um, unfortunately, the owner died last year, leaving a clouded title with eight parties having an interest. Um, due to the redesign required by the State Fish and Wildlife uh, Service, new legals and plats are being prepared to update the appraisal. A second review would be required, and then we'll be ready to make an offer uh, mid to late June, and then they'll have 30 days to respond. Uh, we are at 60% design. Total expenditures to date for environmental right away in design is approximately 1.2 million. Uh, it's been a long, tough process four years, 11 months, 16 days, mm -hmm. just for the environmental clearance, and we're not done. Uh, permits currently underway, which must be complete before the start of construction, include encroachment permits with the city of Bakersfield and Caltrans, including operation and maintenance agreements, Army Corps of Engineers, Section 404 permit, Regional Water Quality Control Board, Section 401 permit, Central Valley Flood Protection Permit, and stream bed alteration agreement with the State Fish and Wildlife. We are on schedule for design completion so that construction, so that we can go back to the CTC in January of 2020 for authorization of our construction funding. Uh, right now we plan to big the project out in the spring of 2020 so that construction could start in the summer of 2020. And it is anticipated approximately 90 working days will be required. Uh, I wanted to assure the board that this project is our top priority and that the county is committed to delivering this project on time. So with that, if there's any questions. Thank you very much. Chairman. Supervisor Couch. I don't know if it's a question. Well, it is kind of a question, but I want to say first, thank you for all your hard work 
I know it's been really frustrating. I'm frustrated, <laughs> and I turn to you, and, and I can see that you're frustrated too. Uh, four years, 11 months, 16 days just to get us to today, but then Correct. we've got to get to January of 2020. Hopefully, by then, we're right. ready to get funding from the CTC. Now, I want to ask Mr. Hakimi a question, and, or you can answer it either one. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding that the right of way <clears throat> Is a, we, we've essentially been told it's not suitable for habitat. But we, is that right? The, the studies that were done by uh, various biologists and concurred with by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife determined that none of the um, path of the bike path would go through suitable habitat for any endangered species in, in, in our area. I, I, this is not your fault. I'm not directing this at you, by the way. So, despite that, we have to do all the environmental studies for the endangered species, uh, which makes so no sense. So, That's where so I'm headed. Um, let, let me uh, just summarize that, and then I think uh, Ms. Miller from Caltrans and maybe Yolanda want to weigh in. So, we've spent a significant amount of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, studying the path that this bike path would take. Uh, all the experts have concluded that um, we are not likely to have any impact to any endangered species, y yet we are being required to still do more surveys and still uh, take measures um, during construction that, um, that would assume that there are species there. And I'll turn it over to Gail. So, let me. I, I don't know anything about the project other than it's a bike path. So, if you're gonna, and it's a, it's a adjacent to or in proximity of a habit. I mean, a conservation habitat. I'm assuming many acres. So you're just gonna lay some concrete asphalt. asphalt. It'll be an asphalt in an area that has no species, but but there's species in the area they're saying they know it, they're in the area and people are going to ride their bikes yeah. so there's no trucks there's this isn't construction well there's there's trucks about 10 feet away on highway 43 they're already there so i would be more <laughs> concerned about the trucks than someone riding their bike and we're supposed to you know the the um the new culture is to alternative active transportation so you would think they would want to facilitate this but um I'm not sure about, what, was there wetlands there? Why was Army Corps, why do you need to get a permit? It, there must be water somewhere. The Kern River, we the go Kern along River, the Kern River, are yes. You and crossing that's their it? jurisdiction. Kern River is considered a navigable, navigable body of okay. water. Are you impacting that at all? We're going underneath the um, State Route 43 and, um, and at I-5. So we have various oh, portions, so you, uh, yes. You're, the p bike path you had to actually construct something to go under it to go underneath okay yes. well you know army corps Along the river might bed. have a leg to stand on um did you elevate this i mean did you just say yes did someone go wait a minute um <laughs> i think you said wait a minute several times <laughs> i mean what i would have <laughs> so i'm just trying to figure out I, I mean, this is, is a, well, that's why in my division, I formed my own environmental branch because I didn't want to do business with Caltrans by, I mean, there, we're still Caltrans, but it's called Central Region. Mm -hmm. I, I spent 13 years in environmental and I had 100% delivery and I never failed in my, uh, that, that just wasn't, you couldn't do that if you worked for me, you delivered um, and you use common sense. So that's why I, have my own unit, but I'm not allowed to work on the big projects. I do local assistance, which we have a great track record for. It just seems like someone would have s elevated this and gone all the way to the top, and because it doesn't make sense to me to spend that kind of money for something that's not invasive. That's not invasive. I mean, Largely, these um, biological studies were required by the Fish and Wildlife Services, and well, because we are going through a conservation area. And yeah, I know that there's sensitivity so, there, right. but still, um, 
you know, Caltrans, I, I can go, I won't say too much about my own agency, but um, <laughs> the regulatory agencies, even when Caltrans is doing a good job, are, I know our regulatory agencies are just, get out of control. I mean, they, it, it's just ridiculous, and it's not getting any better. Um, the SHPO is getting worse with cultural resources. Where, um, and that's the only thing that I can suggest is it has to come from our elected officials. They have their voices louder. They have more power to just keep. And I know Aaron's trying to do what he can do with some of the studies and um, some of the work that is being done that's just really unnecessary. So. Well, I agree. I know. <laughs> I guess I'd probably, I don't know, elevating it would have at least shined some light on it. I hadn't heard anything about this, but um, I would have been asking questions and pounding my fist and whatever but, but I could. Gail, one of the reasons that we brought this up was that these types of delays and what we think are excessive requirements are not uncommon. I mean, th they happen on many projects, not just this project. I mean, there's overlay projects, there's sh shoulder widening projects, and our frustration is um, that we believe all of our agencies are, are in favor of protecting the environment. We know how to protect the environment, yet, yet when we deal with um, other agencies, including sometimes Caltrans, that, that we, we think s sometimes these uh, measures that we uh, are required to uh, deal with these environmental issues seem excessive and they don't seem like a wise use of, of public funds. So you spend a, a lot of money to prove a negative that they already knew was a negative. Mm -hmm. Yes. And to me it seems like it could have been handled by uh, doing the pre-construction surveys. So when you're out there you can have your monitor, you can survey it to say, okay, we can move forward here, there's nothing going on, keep an eye on stuff. What is the species that's um, in this? In well, they have 34 special status species within the preserve, but something that was really special was that they've had, um, they required blunt nose leopard lizard surveys, and they have documented on file that they've not been there for at least 10 years. Yeah. And we've done three years of protocol surveys, yeah. and those are about 20,000 each time. So if time. you have previous surveys, you shouldn't have to be doing more surveys. You'd think. You would think. I mean, you already have it. You have that information. Mm -hmm. And then just just require your monitoring to make sure that they're, you know, just survey before they go in there and break ground. I mean, this is a very simple project. You don't even have to go down very far. I mean, there is a problem, I think, going underneath there but with some excavation. But still, you could, we have monitors all the time. So... I think um, we're going to do a pre... What would you call it? a pre-environmental uh, elevation in the future. <laughs> We're just going to have you elevate it I, at the very beginning. I, I will <laughs> say one thing. Um, the person that is now the uh, division chief for environmental, who's a very good friend of mine and has the right attitude, um, I believe, um, they did have their statewide board meeting um, for all the environmental people and headquarters. They do a statewide meeting every month and bring up hot topics. And so this was a hot topic she wanted to bring up about just the uh, informal and formal consultation. I mean, that Aaron and I talked about that. But then looking at, since we've had NEPA delegation, which has, has created more bureaucracy and people have had to spend more money because of that, um, is looking at what have we gained? You know, we, we've had delegation for quite a while now. What's working, what's not working, and can we do better? And re reviewing all the policies that we implemented as Caltrans on ourselves uh, above and beyond what Federal Highways ever asked us to do. So I'm not sure what's going to come out of that, but they are going to be looking into that. You can, I'll keep you updated. But I was never in favor of delegation. I liked working with Federal Highways. I thought they were more reasonable. Um, and they seem, and maybe back then, Fish and Wildlife was a little easier to get along with. I don't know, but they've kind of run amok, I think. Well, I've been doing environmental review for 20 years now. Eight years of that was U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and Kern County is 
NEPA uh, delegation, uh, or has NEPA delegation, and uh, let me tell you, those projects are very easy to implement. Yeah, and when I worked for the county, I did the same thing, and it did NEPA with, um, with our HUD projects and things like that. And it was a very, but that's, that's the built environment, a little different than um, when you're out there with bulldozers and stuff, but certainly this was a very simple project, so um, we'll keep fighting the fight. Do you need her to elevate anything between now and January? Uh, we still have our Caltrans permit to go through. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's an encroachment encro permit, right? Yes. Oh, no problem. They work right down for me. John Liu. Okay, Patrick, there you go. Call me. Call me. That's why it's on the agenda. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your hard work. Gail, uh, one of the things I'm going to make a comment on is... Uh, you know, we were just in the Valley Voice. We went up to Sacramento and a couple of things that uh, we spoke on um, specifically to what we're addressing here. Because, for example, in Delano, to do a quarter of a mile of a road to resurface it and with overlay, we had to do all of the environmental uh, reports. We had to hire our, our the company we used to do all those reports. We spent hundreds of dollars for a quarter of a mile of an existing road just to overlay it. Was that a local? That was on Pond project? Road. That was a local. Okay, that's my staff. So, so this was a local. Yeah, that's a local assistance oversight project. Um, we kept on local assistance and yeah. uh, through Shane Gunn, and he really um, pushed this through as quick uh, as he, he could. Because he hasn't so. been around. I mean, he's been around for the last uh, couple, maybe a couple of years now. He's new, and um, no, they did a great job of keeping it so. going. Because um, we so. wanted to keep it out of the permitting side where they took oversight yeah, of the project. He'll, he doesn't so. mind taking a risk or working in the gray area or doing every way he can to great. to get things. So I'm glad th that you said that because yes. I would be very disappointed if you hadn't. No, no, so. no. This has all been different factors that have yeah. caused this and problem. Yeah. But Lexington Street, we the same thing. Yeah. I, I need to know what project that is so I can check on that. Cause okay. That Let me have um, Roman Dowling yeah. reach out to you yep. because uh, uh, that's... I think it's a thorn on many of our city sides. Yeah, let me and, find out what happened. And, and um, it's not just Delano. Um, yeah. There are thousands of dollars and sometimes months of delays to do work on an existing uh, pathway mm -hmm. or road just to improve it. And sometimes, like I say, my staff's got the right attitude and they approach it the way they should be, but they get stuck because of Army Corps or U.S. Fish and Wildlife, mm -hmm. I'm going to be reporting on a project that got delayed just because of the Swenson's hawk is now nesting, so we can't go back. and st We have to put it on hold until after September, so after the nesting season. So, yeah, if it's not sometimes us, it's, it's the regulatory agencies, which are a huge problem, and I, that's something that has to happen in Washington, and that's a tough one. Well, I think federal, I think federal though is um, is easier than our state one yeah, right now. For something like what I'm referring to, yeah, because we don't with an off-system project like local assistance, we have no jurisdiction over uh, over CEQA. I mean, we don't. We can comment on it, but mm -hmm. I mean, you're the CEQA lead. We only take we're only the NEPA lead. So it would be U.S. Fish and Wildlife. I mean. Um, Fish and Game, California Fish and Game come mm -hmm. into play, but still, um, it's a little easier for us, those projects, typically. Okay. So. Thank you very much for the report. Question. <laughs> Quick question, Mr. Fox. <laughs> Quick. I'm Dennis Fox. Anyway, you have a clock. on these endangered species, as you know, environmentalists, do not think of cause and effect. They think of nice and not nice, pretty, not pretty. And they have these buy-in initiatives. What is going to happen? Are they taking, will they take money for the endangered species? Uh, a current one is wolves. They're down as far as the um, Do you have humans. a question regarding this and project, I Mr. Know Fox? If we're, going, if we're going to be losing money here to pay for the mountain lions overpasses. That's one thing from Caltrans, taking that money for that. How much money is going for this? 
for these poster children, you know, which the current one is wolves, and the effects thereupon and how much you have to do for that. I know this, I, the latest one is the feds say they're not endangered, and the state, it says, Thank you, Mr. Fox. They are. Okay. I can answer your question. No wolves will be impacted by this project. <laughs> Thank you. No, no wolves on this project. No Thank you. We, we really do appreciate right. your no, staying no with the project. Will be impacted by this project. And we look forward in the summer of 2020 right, yeah. to uh, rider bikes all the way to Buena Vista we're, we're, we're to, s to go to Lightning in a Bottle, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's hear about some projects that are moving forward. Uh, so we've got Formosa 46 and 99 bridge replacement. The median barrier being is being installed along State Route 99 uh, that completed the slopes for the hydro seating, uh, performing punch list items, waiting for railroad flaggers to complete the pavement, dike replacement, final striping and signs. Uh, and we've got the Taft uh, 99 Highway 2R Rehab, so that's a pavement rehabilitation near the city of Bakersfield from north of Herring Road over crossing to Pacheco Road undercrossing. Um, all construction work is done and they CCA'd, meaning they accepted the contract on May 10th. So I won't be reporting on that one anymore. And then um, the State Route 46, uh, that's the two-lane to, two to four-lane widening. Um, that's between Lost Hills and I-5. Constructing Western Transition this week and Eastern Transition will be constructed next week under one-way traffic control at 46. Uh, the ramp was scheduled to, ramp four, was scheduled to be constructed this week. It is anticipated that construction will be completed by June 15th. Uh, there will be some lane closures, um, 46 one-way traffic closure this week and next. Uh, I-5 northbound on-ramp, 55-hour closure expected this week. And since this is Thursday, I'm assuming we only have a couple more days if they're including the weekend. Uh, the I-5 lane closure and full closure during false work release and removal the next four weeks. And then moving on, uh, we've got another uh, pavement rehab on 99. Um, it's 0.3 miles south of Palm Avenue over crossing to Beardsley Canal Bridge. And then they're doing some pavement rehabbing on State Route 178 at that juncture of 99. Um, work currently scheduled for the next 30 days uh, is Southbound medium work from just south of Palm Avenue overcrossing to just north of the 204 overcrossing. Possible pavement replacements in one in lane one from Olive Drive to Beardsley Canal. And then they've got some traffic control going on. Uh, extended lane closures uh, are currently in place and will not be reopened. And this will they will not traffic won't be reopened until 2021. Uh, number one lane northbound has been closed. Uh, State Route 58 overcrossing to just north of uh, the 204. And then also the number one lane has been closed from Beardsley Canal to just south of Palm Avenue overcrossing. Nightly closure of, of adjacent lanes may be needed weekly from Sunday to Thursday to complete the work on the um, Palm Avenue overcrossing and the Beardsley Canal. Only one closure will be permitted per direction. Ramp closures are currently not anticipated. Cottonwood East Rehabilitation on State Route 58. Uh, that's in Bakersfield from Cottonwood Road undercrossing to just east of the um, 58 and 184 separation. Contractor is continuing to pour the CRCP, that's concrete re continuous reinforced concrete pavement. And then the eastbound direction, the number three lane, and the shoulder, um, including the 184 and Fairfax ramps, um, 
So the shoulder between Fairfax and 184, the westbound, they're going to be doing the reinforced concrete. The westbound lane has been excavated between 184 and Oswald. Current end date for working days has been pushed out to July 17th. Cash Creek Bridge Replacement on 58, 8 miles east of Tehachapi from Sand Canyon overhead to half a mile east of Cache Creek. Contractors working on installing K-Rail and reconstructing the outside shoulder and demolition of the eastbound bridge. That will take place on the second week of June. The summit overhead bridge rails, they're replacing the bridge rails on 78 near Tehachapi at summit overhead. They had a pre-construction meeting on, um, that was back in February. Start of construction was moved to the end of this month, uh, to be exact, May 27th due to coordination with uh, Union Pacific Railroad. So there's some delays due to the railroad. Laredo Canal medium gap closure. Um, that's the medium deck closure. It's near Bakersfield at Laredo Canal on 99. Project will be delayed until September because we've got some nesting birds. And then you've got Bell Terrace. That's the constructing uh, Ox Lanes and replace Bell Terrace Bridge on 99. The new connector bridge is formed and will have a stem and soffit poured in the coming weeks. The delay on the northbound retaining wall between Ming Avenue and 58 connector has come to an end and the contractor is prepping for soil nail tests. Additional work on various drainage systems and other item work is ongoing. And then moving on to the California Aqueduct Bridge overlay. And that's at 90, uh, I-5 and 99. Um, the construction area signs were placed last week and construction will most likely start at uh, the end of this month after Memorial Day holiday. Then we've got another bridge. Um, this is the I-5 and 99 bridge separation and pavement rehabilitation. Um, and the project will rehab the northbound outside lanes and shoulder from at the 5 and 99 split to the old US 99, they're doing um, continuous reinforced concrete again. And will imp this, uh, this will improve the bridge vertical clearance um, for some of the trucks. They've been having a problem with that. So we started construction in April on the 22nd. Uh, work taking place at the southbound medium in, under the bridge. Northbound shoulder work from Corpus Road to Union Avenue. And then I've got two roundabouts to talk about. So we got the Stockdale and Enos roundabout. So that's 43 in Stockdale Highway. They're going to start that in the next couple months. And then moving further south, you've got State Route 119 and 43, that intersection. Uh, construction started the beginning of this month. Environmental trapping has been done, wildlife fencing installed, and the detour work is taking place. And that concludes my report, unless there's any comments or um, anything I could do. Any questions? I have a question on that uh, roundabout on 119 and 43. On that detour, how is that going to work, work on that, uh, keep the traffic flow? You know what? He didn't give me any um, information on the detour, and I should know better because that comes up. Every time I talk about a detour, they want to go, well, where? And so that was my fault for not asking him. He just said that there, the detour work is taking place. So I don't know if that means they figured it out or so. Let me find out and then I'll, I'll get back to you and let you know. Thank you. That's an excellent question. And next time I'll make sure to I get those details. Gail, I just want to thank you. Last time uh, we met, I had some questions and you've answered those questions. In fact, the temporary lights that were there that in my opinion were blinding uh, yeah. the drivers have been removed and been replaced with uh, pole lights which now face down yes and so the and question I still have is whether um, you know not putting some kind of a railing might someday cause a car to go down well you know time will tell yeah and I did I, I asked that question and I, I pushed back on his answer because they did the testing and they went out there and they looked at I mean it's everything's geometrically designed and we safety is our number one concern when we're designing and their answer was they felt it it was fine and it was safe even though they did admit it was a little steep so let's hope that I never have to go back and say I told you so 
So, um, but going home um, after last month's meeting, I could, s I mean, I'm glad those lights are gone now, but I could see them from, I was, I had to have been at least a half mile, a mile away. I didn't actually go up on the ramp, but they were pretty blinding. So I, I went back there and told them, I'm, you can't let those stay up like that. So they go, no, no, they're, they're coming down. In fact, they're going to come down this weekend. I went, okay. I'll well, I thank you there. for looking into it. Yeah, thanks. Seeing no other questions, uh, Executive Director's report. Good, ev good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman and board members. I have a few items on this agenda. Uh, I've established a monthly meeting on the status of 46 with Kern County and Caltrans and uh, sometimes Wonderful Corporation uh, joins us. Our most recent meeting was May 13th and I want to publicly thank uh, the county f uh, for one hiring a right-of-way expert Mr. Don Anderson to help us with that process he's making enormous progress and uh, I'm pleased to report that project is on on schedule and will certainly keep this board and you supervisor couch updated uh, the California Transportation Commission met yesterday and today in San Diego we had a staff member there uh, I want to report uh, some good news for several of our cities Bakersfield received 3.3 million uh, in additional funds for the Bell Terrace project. Um, Kern County received 4.5 million for the Rexland Acres uh, sidewalk project. Wasco received 188,000 for the Palm Avenue bike and pedestrian improvements. Delano received two funding for two projects, 71,000 for a safe route to schools gap closure and 26,000 for another safe routes to school intersection enhancement education uh, program and your staffs have been notified of, of those results. Last month we received an update or a report from Jim Moore on our triennial uh, TDA audit which audited all of all of your communities that operate transit and also audited Kern Cog we held a workshop this week, May 15th, that was very well attended by almost every single um, city and the county in, uh, in the county. And we haven't waited. We've already implemented all um, the findings and recommended fixes to that, that study. And your staff is, is fully cooperating. Uh, June 12th, please mark your calendars, will be the centennial groundbreaking. That is a project that I've personally worked on for over 20 years and many people have worked on for uh, close to a decade. We'll be 930 in Bakersfield. The location is yet to be determined. And congratulations to City of Bakersfield. On May 8th, they awarded the final contract for the TRIP program, which is to complete uh, the long-awaited Centennial Carter. Subject to any of your questions, uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions? Certainly. Only if the chair likes it. So one of the topics after the CTC meeting was a uh, potential um, new rulemaking by the current ad, uh, federal administration that if that rulemaking is implemented, um, it would have a detrimental effect uh, on all areas of the country that are non-attainment, specifically all areas of, of California that are in non-attainment. We are in non-attainment. Um, it's an issue that if, if you just want to Google Mary Nichols ARB, there's already been three or four articles that I've seen posted just today based on her comments. Um, it, it is turning into a, uh, another one of many battles between California and, and the Trump administration. Um, California is, in my opinion, not likely to pr prevail. I, I will keep you updated. Um, the League of uh, California Cities is aware of it, CalCog is aware of it, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I know you're active with CalCog. There will be a discussion on it. I will uh, have some information for all of you all of you next month about it. 
So, so, so the CTC's position is they're not in favor of these federal rules. Thank you. Any other member comments? Seeing none, we will adjourn to the next meeting. Roll call stays the same. Yes. Any public comments? <laughs> Seeing none. Consent agenda. Same information as before. Does anybody wish to take an item off the consent agenda? Seeing none, can I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Roll call vote. Trujillo? Yes. Crum? Yes. Alvarado? Yes. Vallejo? Yes. Reyna? Yes. Mauer? Yes. Cryer? Yes. B. E. Smith? Yes. Couch? Yes. Lucinovich? Yes. Thank you. Item four, final current COG fiscal year 2019-20 financial plan. Good evening, Chairman Smith, members of the board. If it pleases the board, I'd like to try something different and start with a brief summary and then see about the details later. This is the third time you've seen this financial plan. It has not changed since the preliminary, which was presented to you last month. It includes about $5.7 million in revenues. The biggest chunk of those being from federal sources, followed by state sources, and then local and miscellaneous sources. We have programmed about $5.4 million in expenditures to fund the staff, professional services, services and supplies. This financial plan provides appropriations for everything that was in the overall work program, which was adopted earlier in the consent agenda. Um, I can stop there and ask if y'all have any questions. Y'all, can you tell I was in the South for five days? Um, if you don't have any questions, we can move to the public hearing and then on to the approval. Any questions? And members? Seeing none, I will open the public hearing. Any comments from the public? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Move and approval. Voice vote. <coughs> Second. Trujillo. Yes. Crump. Yes. Alvarado. Yes. Vallejo. Yes. Reyna. Yes. Mauer. Yes. Cryer. Yes. B. Smith. Yes. Couch. Yep. Lucinovich. Yes. Thank you. Final KMAA fiscal year 2019-2020 financial plan. Yes, sir. Like the Kern Cog budget, this one has not changed since you saw it last month um, as well. It includes 770000 in revenues, which are generated from a dollar um, on your vehicle registration that are turned back to the county. The expenditures total about 570000 and they fund the maintenance and the um, operation of our 511 system, the litter collection that the gentleman earlier was speaking about, and some additional um, law enforcement, um, safety related enforcements. So with that, we can have another public hearing. Thank you, I will open the public hearing. Any comments from the public? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and ask for a motion. So moved. Second. Second. I believe this is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none. Thank you. Appointment of a third member of the executive committee. Ms. Napier. Hey, it's chair rule. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, the Kern Cog Policy Manual defines the makeup of the Kern Cog Board Executive Committee. The manual states the Executive Committee shall be comprised of the Chairman, 
the representative of the city of Bakersfield and one representative of the county of Kern. The manual goes on to say, in the event that the representative of the city of Bakersfield and the county of Kern hold the positions of chairman and vice chairman, the third member shall be appointed by a majority vote of the council. The chairman is the representative of the city of Bakersfield. The vice chairman, Zach Scrivener, is absent tonight. Therefore, Supervisor Couch will represent Kern County and the board needs to select another individual to serve on the Kern Car Board Executive Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a nomination? Mr. Chairman, can I, if I'm on the committee, can I make, can I make a nom nomination? I'll nominate uh, Member Vallejo to serve. Are you, you willing to serve? <laughs> <laughs> right. I think I have a tiny spot on my plate there, so yes. <laughs> Great. Uh, voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, approved. And Mr. Chairman, if I may, on this item, um, due to the Brown Act, since this is a standing committee of Kern Cog, um, the executive committee would not be able to meet tonight. Uh, such meetings would have to be noticed in accordance with the Brown Act. Great, I get to go home early. <laughs> Executive Director's Report. Good, <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. Um, last week, as Council Member uh, Vallejo mentioned, uh, Ms. Napier and I and Council Member Vallejo and um, Mayor Garcia from Wasco attended a um, San Joaquin Valley Policy Conference in Lemoore. Um, very uh, productive. Both Council Member Vallejo and I m have a new best friend in the governor's office. He's welcome to expand upon that. I've already invited him to come and visit with this board. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll see him as soon as next month. W would you like to say anything about that, uh, Council Member Vallejo? Just to say he was very interested in what was going on throughout our county. Obviously, I had to share about Delano and our halos and many other things. Uh, and so he's also going to be making a trip out to Delano. He'll be contacting me for a date. Um, but uh, he just felt that we really seem to be working together in our in our county. And, and I think that says something both for the uh, Board of Supervisors and the, the councils of every single city we're in. But it was a very good uh, conference. I think the presentations were great. And, uh, you know, this relationship, I think we want to foster it because uh, anybody who's close to the governor, we want to make sure they're on our side. So. A few more items, Mr. Chairman. Uh, June 19th to the 21st, Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Ad Administration will be conducting their federal review of Kern Cog. Kern Cog acts as, a f as the federally recognized metropolitan planning organization. Um, several of you may be interviewed during that process, including you, uh, the chairman, Mr. Smith. There's a, a, a notification letter in your um, folder and they will be attending our next board meeting and will likely also be involved with a tour um, the day before and a listening session the day public listening sh session the day before and I've invited that representative from the governor's office to join us on that uh, that tour and I want to publicly thank the county for um, for providing a helicopter f uh, for that tour because the county is so big um, SB2 planning grants program. There will be a workshop here at Kern Cog June 5th. There's information in your folder. I'll get to that in one minute. Um, and I want also in your folder is an email. I've told a few of you, but not all of you. The Kern County Sheriff's Department is, is terminating um, the relationship that, that they have with us for the litter pickup program where we use. Um, jail inmates to pick up litter. Um, I've already um, started the process to initiate a new agreement with the Public Works Department who is uh, likely to uh, contract with with uh, homeless people to pick up the litter just the way we are doing in in Metro Bakersfield but we will 
essentially have a similar program for the non-metro areas of the county. Obviously, um, the homeless people get paid significantly more than the inmates. The inmates don't get paid at all, and we hold, uh, pay the homeless individuals uh, at least minimum wage and in some cases more. Um, but we are on top of it, and we will bring back a contract when we complete those negotiations. Uh, in your folders this evening is the email I mentioned from the um, Sheriff's Department terminating the relationship uh, for the debris removal contract, an announcement of that planning grant program, and on the second page of that announcement is the dollar amounts that each of your organizations are eligible for. And this is a non-competitive program. You will get those dollar amounts listed there that range from 625000 for both the County of Kern and Bakersfield, all the other cities, $160,000 to conduct um, planning work related to housing. There are some... Uh, S some catches, though. You have to have a, a housing element, but I believe almost all of your housing elements are current. If you have questions, please uh, either come to the uh, workshop, call me, or certainly send your staff to that workshop. A timeline covering the next uh, six months, outreach efforts covering the, uh, several public articles, the letter from the federal joint letter from Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration notifying us of the review. Excellent article that m mentions uh, Chairman Smith and several of his family members about development in Bakersfield. Um, chart that I believe has been discussed extensively at uh, Mr. Hightower mentioned. Uh, Kern Transportation Foundation about an hour and a half ago at, during public comments. Um, the majority of, the, of that conference was about logistics and distribution centers um, and how they are changing and how they are part of the, a permanent part of the economy of Kern County where they weren't as recently as 10 years ago. Um, this is a, an interesting piece of information that Mr. Ball has been working on for years and continues to evolve. The um, slide which has contact information from the electric aviation presentation earlier today. Uh, subject to any questions, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions? I, I have one question. Um, in regards to the workshop that you're going to have, um, when when is that going to take place so I can... Um. It is here at Kern Cog, Wednesday, June 5th, 1.30 p.m. And Thank I believe it'll, it'll be pres the presenter will be the Governor's Office, Housing and Community Development. Thank you. You're welcome. In here? Any other questions? Any member statements? Seeing none, we are adjourned.